tune. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zura Kamimo, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this conversation on great threats to humanity, sustainable energies, and climate change. This conversation is taking place virtually as a webinar. We're live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, where you can also comment and ask questions. Now, Atlantic Dialogues has an extraordinary gift for bringing together the most extraordinary of speakers. Let me introduce them, starting with Inchimunya Hamakoma, an Atlantic Dialogues Emerging Leader and Research Manager with the award-winning Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator in South Africa. Sanjoy Joshi, the Chairman and CEO of the Observer Research Foundation in India. Uh, Dr. Marie Luomi, Research Fellow at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, CAPSARC, in Saudi Arabia. And last but not least, Saeed Moulin, who's the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency. Welcome. Now, if a success of the recently concluded UN Climate Summit COP26 was the agreement to cap global warming at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial above pre levels, then the consensus seems to be that it failed to secure a hard pledge on the phasing out of fossil fuels, mainly coal. Climate injustice remains with us, which is why we're having this conversation, to explore the changes in systems we need to move towards sustainable energies. I'll start with you, Marie, because uh, you have been a climate change negotiator um, have, and have attended several COP meetings um, over the past couple of years. On a scale of one to 10, how successful would you say COP26 was? Um, thanks, Zuluak. It's my honor to kick this off. And um, you, you have a very tough question there. Um, I, I have been following the COPs for a while. This was my 11th COP. I've never been a negotiator myself, but I've been uh, in various capacities, including organizing one COP myself. So with that, kind of looking at this from, from a global and a, and a southern perspective in particular, I would give this a seven or an, or an eight. And, and one of those reasons is, is that I'm, I'm an optimist, and one has to be optimist in this field of, in the field of work. The second reason is that I think one has to understand that the, the expectations were for this COP were perhaps artificially high. So the purpose, as I see it, of this COP was never to fully bridge the gap. The, the role of the Paris Agreement is to help gradually bridge the gap. So this was an important milestone in that role. However, uh, this was not a COP to end all COPs. They, they, will have to con they will have to continue, unfortunately, and the fight is far from over. And I think a lot of attention was also put on that specific sentence on coal. And I would just say that it's historic that coal, fossil fuel subsidies, climate justice, carbon budget, many of these new words actually made their way into the text. But that was far from what this COP was actually about. So it was about the rule book, finalizing the rule book of the Paris Agreement. It was about raising ambition, so keeping the rule book of the Paris Agreement of 2015. So six years to some sort of agreement on the rule book is what you're telling us. Yeah, so rule book was about agreeing on how do countries go about when they want to exchange carbon credits, for example. And here we have a pretty solid agreement that prevents double counting. So countries can't claim uh, the same reductions twice. It provides some money for developing countries for climate adaptation. And um, it's a kind of it's a quite a robust set. And there were a couple of other areas also of that rule book that finally got wrapped up. And there was this kind of unfinished business from 2018, 19, and they finally did it. So now the Paris Agreement can actually start really to be operationalized and implemented, which at the end of the day is what matters when you want to bring down emissions. But then it was also about enabling the action on the ground. And there, I think there was a bit of a more mixed bag of results. And I'd just like to say a few, few words about the finance piece of the package, which is very crucial for developing countries. And, and there, there was a recognition, even before the COP, that developed countries haven't reached this self-set $100 billion target for, for climate finance. And so this gave developing countries a bit of a stronger, stronger sort of leverage to push for more. So <clears throat> much, much more is needed, but at least there's now a track to keep developed countries uh, 
to keep track on that one, 100 billion promise. There is a new track to negotiate a new goal post-2025. There the African groups wish or position to have a 1. trillion annual target up from 100 billion. That did not fly, but there's at least a process to get that goal negotiated in the next two years, three years. Um, there was a bit of disappointment on the fact that loss and damage, which refers to the impacts of climate change to which countries can no longer adapt, like sea level rise, for example, there no financing was agreed. There was simply a dialogue that will enable discussions to continue. So I think the next COP will have to do something about this loss and damage, and of course, keep a track on how do we keep the financing going. But overall, as, as Grenada said in the final day of the conference, Glasgow was not the destination. It was a step forward. Failure was not an option because this was about the credibility of the Paris Agreement. And that, that got saved, but we must continue the fight until the job is done. Thank you, Marie. Um, and Chimonia, I'll come to you because one of the um, clear aspects of the climate in injustice that we're trying to forestall is that um, the uh, climate, the planet, um, and the future for young people uh, is precarious. And so where do you see, uh, how do you see this um, from where you sit um, as a young person who works with other young people to ensure their prospects for the future? Thank you so much for that question, Edouard. Um, and I think it, it's such an important question because look, that's the only thing that we have going for us. Like that's the only thing that we know about is that we have to kind of figure out a way to keep the human race going on this planet because this is the one planet we have. And I think what that fundamentally means is starting to rethink some of the ways that we've been thinking previously. So my big ticket item that I've been speaking about a lot this whole year is this idea that like, by 2035, Africa will be the largest contributor of young people to the work, like the working to the workforce. So the 18 year olds that are coming into the world, the 18 year olds that are coming to the workforce today, more than the rest of the world combined, those 18 year olds are the majority African. And by the time we get to 2100, 42% of the world's working age population overall will be African. And so for me, this says that like, when we're getting to a stage where like this particular part of the world is what's growing and this particular part of the world is what is where things are happening, we kind of need to take a closer look and say, okay, so what is actually happening there? And right now from the African perspective, the majority of that work that's happening there is informal. Many young Africans don't have access to opportunity, don't have access to jobs. Um, weirdly enough on the climate science perspective, there are some parts of that that are positive in that like Africa today still counts for less than 1% of the cumulative global emissions, even though the population size is at 1 billion. So there's like a cynical answer that's like, okay, we can just leave those people over there like that and it'll be fine and we're not gonna see emissions rise. But like, if we're honest with ourselves, that solution is not gonna work because the way that our economies and our systems are, are structured is on that like very old school economics paradigm of land, capital and labor. And those are the modes of productivity and those are like the sort of like core rules to so much of our like current financial system runs. And for the longest time, we've had a really high emphasis on capital. And that has been like the big thing. Whereas now I think we're starting to realize that like people are important, right? The working conditions, the lives of people are important. And also like the land, the planet, the climate is important. And so as I think we're, as we're stepping towards the future, it needs to become a sort of new accounting for that framework and a new kind of balance where capital isn't the only determining factor in how we make things make sense. And then we're also with ourselves quite honest about how much of a factor capital is in getting things done. You know, when President Obama was speaking um, at COP26, he, he spoke directly to young people. Um, you know, even as he you know, asked us to, you know, keep, remain angry and engaged with this. And somehow, even though we we, we see and feel the, precar the precarity of you know, futures for young people, which is you know, where you work primarily. It doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it feels like we, we don't hear a lot um, from young people on the African continent about climate change and its impact on, 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 on their future. Or maybe I, 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 I don't have access to certain spaces, but, but that's- No, I mean- I mean, I think like there's like there's a couple of things. So I, I don't know how controversial I want to be on the stage, but like a key example of that was controversial. Please be controversial. So like 
Let's go with racism. So racism is a big thing in the climate community, and it's also a big thing in the way that media is. So if you ever saw there was that picture of like the young um, climate yeah, activist, and there was, huh? Yeah, there was three young white women, and there was one black woman, and literally. And that's the party from Uganda. Yeah, she was she was cropped out of that image because what felt more sellable to those news paper articles was that it was those three young women who were the representatives of the climate future. Also, when we come to the discussions about what climate change means, there are people who are willing to kind of grade human life on the spectrum and have a kind of overzealousness in terms of like, which kind of human life is valuable. So those are the kind of, you should stop having children. The reason that you're having children is the reason um, that the planet is going down. Whereas like actually, it's a little bit more complex than that. So I think with those two reasons, you, what you'll find is that there are a lot of really exciting African climate activists who are talking, who are caring, who are bringing forth a lot of indigenous knowledge. Their platform on the global stage is significantly reduced. And also the climate movement itself has some serious challenges in the way that it values people. I think it's not to see African voices that are um, excluded. I think it's um, indigenous voices from all over the world. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Sandra, I'll come to you um, because, of course, um, you're going to tell us that um, you have transitioned to, so, uh, to sustainable energy and it's working. Um, but my question to you is how can um, uh, how, can, how can the transition to sustainable energies be done in a way that doesn't have people feeling left out? No, you're muted, Sanjoy. Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Sanjoy. There you are. Thank you. Thank you, God, for the question. Uh, we've had two excellent presentations, both by Mari and Ichmania, which uh, uh, makes things uh, much easier for me uh, to say what I have to say. Uh, first of all, I think talking about COP and what happens at COP26, uh, it must be underlined that you know, COP26 took place under very, very difficult circumstances. I mean, that one has to admit that, you know, there was normally COP meetings happen after a lot of preparations. There's a lot of pre-work which goes into these negotiations. Uh, but circumstances were last two years, uh, you know, you, one, you had COVID, which had a major impact. But then you also had this big trade war going on between the US and China, trade technology, and lots of other things started happening, you know, which, which were not actually making the most powerful countries see eye to eye with each other. So a lot of issues tended to get mixed up uh, due to that. We can talk about that later. And uh, third, of course, you know, right before COP26, you had this massive spike in fossil fuel energy prices and which completely, you know, derailed a lot of European perceptions about what the energy transition was really about. And people started questioning. And the funny thing is that uh, you, you have talks about phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, and you're talking about fossil fuel subsidies, you, uh, the European Union actually started thinking of giving subsidies because of the sudden spike in gas prices. So, you know, suddenly the shoe is on the other foot. So this is a complicated transition. Let us please admit the green transition is not an easy transition. It is, it is a complicated transition. It is a complex transition. It's a transition which involves markets, it's a transition which involves investors. It's a transition which involves, which both Mari and Nishimuni have pointed out, the big question of finance. Who is going to put the money on the table? And I think the biggest failure of COP26 has been on the aspect of finance. We've been a miserable failure there. Uh, right from Paris to COP, and that is where the whole question of climate justice and very well pointed out by Antonia that climate justice is, is the key thing. The good thing about this COP, everything considered, everything said and done, the one good thing about this COP, which Amari alluded to, was that actually, I think for the first time, uh, the smaller countries, developing nations, actually managed to put climate justice back prominently on the agenda. And climate justice is not about what you're emitting this year, what you're emitting till 2030, 2040, 2050. Climate justice is also about the carbon space you have been occupying. I mean, you start looking at the figures. 
you look at the carb you talk about carbon budget what is global warming due to it is due to the all the accumulated accumulated carbon sitting out there the us sits on 25% of it the eu sits on 22% of it china because of its rapid growth is now sitting about still about 10 11% of it countries like india are occupying you know in one corner 3% of that carbon space and a whole host of countries across africa which need to make that transition which 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 we need to do poverty alleviation they need to provide basic minimum energy needs to their people otherwise energy poverty does not let them move anywhere so yes they need to transit to sustainable lifestyles the whole world needs to trust to trans, you know, transit to sustainable lifestyles but then the contributions which need to come in ultimately i think at subsequent cops after the discussions that are taking place in glasgow and and that is where i think glasgow has been a success is that the larger question of what we are doing with the squatters on the carbon space the squatters who refuse to vacate the carbon space and who are not willing to give one inch of that space to anybody else and you come out with fancy accounting schemes like net zero no that 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 is a big scheme and you you keep kicking the can down the road someone says we'll be net zero in 2050 someone says we'll be net zero in 2060 someone says we'll be net zero in 2070 so these are accounting frameworks which some clever chartered accountant has drawn up which are basically kicking the can down the road and not really addressing the issue of climate climate change so the big issue which needs to be tackled is about finance is about space and that is the whole story of the energy transition that energy transition needs to be discussed it needs to be planned and so having so clearly mapped out the injustice in this uh, space for us uh, sunjoy um what would you like to see in terms of the financing of the energy transition what would be on your wish list no this is not a wish list see uh, we have we are just recovering from covid yeah and uh, if you if you look at the last one year you had countries who threw 14 trillion dollars fighting covid largely on their own populations you know uh, when when you look at the template for global cooperation and look at the response to covid you re- you realize what is wrong with the world there is something seriously wrong with us knowing very well that no one is safe until everybody is safe look at the responses now when an immediate crisis like covid drew this response you had countries holding vaccines just like they hold uh, you know carbon space they were holding vaccines now covid was an immediate immediate you know it it it, it is not something which is affecting future generations it is something which is affecting present generations right now so looking at the response of covid and the response to covid it is no surprise that countries which threw 14 trillion dollars at covid are refusing to commit even less than 100th of that value 100 billion dollars which was agreed to in paris not even that 100 billion dollars is going to be put on the table for an completely just cause which needs to be there so i think we need to scale up our ambitions and the and the african cause that okay raise this talk about one a few trillion dollars put put that on the table is absolutely legitimate there's no question about it 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 has to get back on the table otherwise we are not being serious about fighting climate change we are being as serious about it as we are being about actually fighting covid so no, that, that that is a disappointing thing so the framework of global cooperation actually needs to become a little more serious and i think climate negotiations need to be more about the earth rather than about geopolitics that 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 is very important thank you sanjoy so said i come to you um because if sanjoy has um given us the picture of climate injustice mm-hmm. and singled out finance and the lack of seriousness to um combating climate change my question to you um given uh you know your role at the agency um in in Morocco what else should we be thinking about as we think about you know transition the transition to sustainable energies well thank you first of all uh, for organizing this event and thank you to uh, uh for this uh, to participate to, again to this atlantic dialogues and 
especially for this topic today. Of course, we just um, after the COP26, but uh, in Morocco, we organized the COP7 in 2001 in Marrakech and the COP16 uh, uh, in 2000. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, in 2016, the COP22, uh, and all the discussion during the COP, especially for Africa, what we said about the energy transition, uh, knowing that the continent has 600 million of citizens without electricity today, uh, when you start talking about the impact of uh, climate change and uh, all the responsible of climate change, yes, you have many debates. But one thing very important, uh, Sanjay just talked about uh, the financial part, but I would like to start with the political part. We had the chance in Morocco that in 2009, the King's letter was very clear. They gave prior, priority to renewable energy and energy efficiency in our energy policy. When you have a strong political support at the highest level of the state, you can convince many actors in the country. It's very important. Because when you discuss about all the impact, because as an African country, you're not a big emitter, you're not a big, you have not a big impact on on, uh, uh, on, on emissions, but you need to do something. And to have this strong political support is the first thing. Then you have the legal framework. You need to have, and to be coherent in your policy. If you're going to give priority to renewable energy and energy efficiency, you need to stop subsidize fossil fuel at the same time. So you have to be current in your policy. You have to push what we want to push, of course, and to show that it's economic. It's very important. You cannot say to people who have a uh, uh, lot of investment to do just to add investment more, just to be clean. You need to show them that, that you need to have uh, a sensibilization for that to show them that the impact and the global economy for the project is very important and they're going to decrease the energy bill with this energy transition. It's very important. Today we have the chance. It was not the case 10 years or 15 years before. Now it's the case. Renewables are becoming the cheapest way to produce electricity. It's something that is changing a lot of things. So that's why I'm quite optimistic. <laughs> Uh, I know that we had many discussions during the COP, even when you have decisions, but all the on the field to have the project in, implemented was not another story. We managed uh, used to present this example um, because when you have the legal framework, when you have the technical support, when you have the financial support, you can, and when you have sensibilization, you can reach your objective. One example. In the kingdom, we had a program to help farmers to switch from diesel pumps to solar pumps. So in all rural areas, in different regions of the country, we start by sensibil the, sensibilization, the sensibilization of the farmers. You need to have actors who can size, implement, maintain solar pumps in the field, in the rural areas. So we have a program for training, for capacity building with the private sector to have people dedicated to that. Then you need financial support. You need to convince, and we managed to convince the local banks, the Crédit Agricole du Maroc, it's a local banks dedicated to farmers with the Tiamouil Fillah, another bank dedicated to that. And when you have the sensibilization, when you have the people who can do it uh, in a serious way. When you have uh, the financial support, you can reach, today we have more than 40,000 farmers using uh, solar pumps, and we are pushing for that because it's also to show them the economy of the project. The transition has to be clear for them. If you need to have all the actors, not only the rich one, the rich ones, they, it's easy for them to do big investment and to change. But when you have to work, you need to look at all the points, all the points, and especially the technical ones and the financial ones at the same time. So when you have the financial support, when you have the technical uh, in the field, you can reach your objectives. So the energy transition, you need also all those points to to have 
of course, the legal framework, the technical support, the financial support, and also this strong proactive policy at the highest level of the state. Mm. Because many people can tell you, we are not big emitter. Why should we change? Why? So we are not responsible of crime. Yeah, of course, they're, they're right. But everyone is concerned today because we are living the, uh, the impact of climate change in our continent. And it's something that we have to uh, present as we are actors today and we can decrease our own energy uh, emissions, but also our, our energy bill. So that's why it's interesting, but you need to have those support. Okay. Uh, Mary, hey, no, no, so, Said, I'll come to you um, um, with that question later, but I want to I want to pick up on the political support. And um, because you've given us an example of farmers and yeah. agriculture is a key industry across Africa. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the political support, what does it translate? Um, how does it translate at the at the political level across the government? Yeah. And um, you know, what policies have you instituted to demonstrate um, political will? Yeah, uh, the agency is uh, uh, belonging to the Ministry of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development. But you need to convince the Ministry of Finance. You need to convince the Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture. You need to convince all the actors concerned by one, one topic, you know? So, of course, your department is really pushing for that. But you need to have all the actors. That's why this political support is very important not only for one department, but all departments are concerned about the energy transition. We have a program for the industry. Of course, uh, for decarbonization of the industry, we have also uh, a guide now for financing that. It's something that is very important, but you need to have also the sensibilization with the business federation. We have a program dedicated to that and you need each time to sensibilize, to have the link, the, the link with the financial support. And we have big project with the renewables in Morocco. Did, developed through public-private partnership, developed with development banks directly. But all the small projects, the thousands of small projects, linked to solar pumping, linking to solar roof in the industry, linked to energy efficiency industry, they need local banks to be also actors to finance those small projects. At the end, today we have um, for 40,000 farmers, it's 500 megawatt of, of PV, it's the same as the big solar plant in Wazazat, uh, where we have solar plant for producing electricity for the grid. So the big project managed to have uh, a lot of financing. The small project is more difficult to have all the financing and support for that. And the, their impact for jobs creation, their impact on uh, decreasing the energy bill for the citizens, for the farmers, for the industry. So it's very important to look at all the small projects at the same time as you're looking for the big project. And during the COP, everyone is able to finance big wind park. Even in Africa, huh? we, we managed to have those support. But for the small projects, it's another story. And we need for energy efficiency and for small renewables to have this, the same support. Okay, thank you. So look, one of the clear messages um, from COP26 was that uh, time is running out. And if, you know, as Sanjoy was um, um, reminding us, our response to climate change is anything like the response to COVID, we're in trouble. Um, you know, whether we're talking about vaccines or whether we're talking about climate, um, you recall the Barbadian um, Prime Minister so eloquently reminding us that um, what we're seeing is a failure of leaders to lead. We're not doing enough. We're, no, we're not moving fast enough. But Saeed has just given us an example of Morocco showing leadership um, on this front, even though Morocco is not one of the, you know, um, most egregious emitters um, on the planet. So Sanjoy, my question is to you, how can countries of the Atlantic Basin show leadership on this, on climate change? The first thing that uh, countries of the Atlantic Basin need to do is when they talk climate, they should be talking climate, and it should not be about geopolitics. Climate is too serious a business, and uh, climate change, uh, you know, the, everyone is feeling the depredations of what is happening across the world. Look at what is happening in British Columbia today. You know, there was a time when uh, it was said that only the small island nations far away are going to be affected by what is happening to the climate. Today, you're seeing the effects of it in every country in the world. 
British Columbia has a problem. Spain has a problem. There are forest fires in Australia. Time and time again, you are having these you know, effects of what we've done to our environment. So it is far more serious than I think political leaders are willing to make it out to be, than the strategic community is willing to accept. It is still becoming far too much a debate about you know, larger interests, larger geopolitical interests, uh, something very interesting happened, if you see uh, right at COP26. I mean, the US and China were uh, for a long time trying to reach some agreement, I mean, as after the Biden administration came in. And there's several rounds of negotiations with the Chinese, and the Chinese very clearly said, sorry, climate alone is not on the table. You will need to talk about far other issues which you have, which relate to trade, which relate to technology, and if you see the progress of events, finally the agreement happened on the 10th of November, a while between the negotiations on at COP were going on. And this whole debate we've been having about phase out of coal or phase down of coal is very India, much part India. of that agreement. It is a language of the text of the agreement between the US and China. So obviously there are some negotiations happening and these negotiations are far larger than climate negotiations. You, you, you had an apex meeting you know, between President Xi and President Biden, which has taken place. You know, certain decisions have taken, not been taken, some have been shared, some have not been shared. So there are larger games at play here. So the first thing I think everyone needs to do particularly the OECD, but particularly the Atlantic continues to do, is make climate negotiations about this planet and not about saving the planet, about saving humankind. The planet is not in danger. The planet will survive. Human beings have a problem. Let's be very clear about it. It's, it this is not about saving the earth. The earth will survive you. Please save yourselves. Do something about it. Right. So in Chimonia, if we're to save ourselves, we hear that one of the things we must consider is uh, subsidies. But there's also talk of technological transfers. Um, but from you know various quarters, you hear that you know technological transfers, these subsidies are used and you know are are dispatched as one size fits all approaches. Um, what do you think we need to do in order to ensure that these approaches work for us? You know, work for. Um, people, you know, um, in the most vulnerable countries, the countries most vulnerable to climate change. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I feel like Sanjay, I just, I love, I love listening to you speak because I'm just like, it's giving me a lot of fire and it's giving me a lot of energy on this side because the, you're right, like the planet will survive. If we don't get this right, we won't. And when it comes to these technological transfers, we need to be serious. And we actually need to be honest. So before this uh, meeting, when I did one of the quick things I did was like, was like okay, let me just check. So I, I was like, let me just make sure that I'm coming at this correctly. But like, if we're honest about what's required from a technological perspective, it is right now either incredibly expensive or technologically inefficient to expect countries that don't have their base load power sorted out to be putting their base loads on energy because of where we are in terms of the technology around batteries. It's just something that is practically quite difficult. So if you are from a policy perspective, from an emerging economy, and you need to make a choice of, am I gonna to try to create jobs for millions of people, or am I going to try to contribute to climate change um, disaster that I didn't make? I mean, the, the choices are quite clear. And so if we can be honest about um, that fact, and if we can be honest about those differences, then we can also design policies that mitigate for them and make sure that we put the kind of finance on the table that makes it possible for countries that don't have stable energy constructions right now to choose ones that are more green and give us a better chance of a better climate future. But if we're not honest, that's not going to happen. And like the truth is that like, even if you look at the list, and that was what I started to mention at the beginning, like if you look at the list of who's nearly at 100% or whatever, those countries are often lucky enough to have hydropower and have the kinds of methods that don't require heavy battery storage, which allows them to be as energy efficient as they are. If you're a country that wasn't um, equipped with those natural privileges, then unless we're talking honestly about the money, we're saying, sorry for you, it's not actually economically or even, I might even go as far as to say, ethically feasible for you to make that choice for your people if you're making the choice between having an economic structure where people can live and live more prosperative lives versus this, what for now, because of the way the human brains work, feels like a distant future that you could maybe make some steps towards in the future. 
I'm not sure whether to be depressed or optimistic <laughs> listening to you, but given that, look, Njimunya, you've painted a picture for what um, um, the lack of um, access to technology looks like. So if we're designing um, for vulnerable countries, particularly the ones you describe um, that have no natural privileges, what should we be thinking about? I think we should be thinking about how do we make the technology work for the most number of people? So how do we promote um, green solutions that are also people solutions that make it easier for policymakers to buy into and also be very honest. And I think like the decision of COP26 that came out for South Africa with South Africa and a number of international partners, including the US and the UK to just give South Africa money to make this transition is, 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 is what we need. It's not, I mean, could be wrong, but it doesn't seem that complicated because it needs money. And if we just give the people the money so that they can do what needs to be done, I think that will take us quite a ways in making sure that we have a more sustainable future for everyone. Mm. Okay, so let's get the perspective from the Gulf countries. Maria, I'll come to you um, because we've heard about the geopolitics, um, you know, um, the big, big uh, world powers. We've heard a perspective from um, South Africa and from Morocco. Tell us about the Gulf and how um, they have been navigating the transition to sustainable energies. Right. Thanks, Odiak. The developing world, as we all know, is incredibly diverse in terms of national circumstances. So we've heard from some Sunjoy about India, which is under a lot of pressure simply because it's a huge country. And for India, it's an issue about per capita emissions and, and justice. There are small island states for whom 1.5 really is a question of survival. So that's their big thing. Uh, for African countries, it's about adaptation, they're not so responsible for this problem. So it's more about adaptation. It's about finance in a big way. And then we have the oil exporting countries in the Middle East for whom climate change has for long been a very difficult issue because of course, as any other country, they want to see the issue solved. But until today, solving that issue is also a threat to their main source of income. So in that sense, I've been following this topic for well over a decade now. And the good news is the region has come a very long way and the positive trend is accelerating. And we are now seeing this both at the domestic level and regionally. So I, I'll speak very briefly about the domestic and then I'll say a few words about the regional, if, if I may. So domestically, uh, renewable energy has really been picking up, at least in the plans. Saudi Arabia now has a 50% renewable energy target for 2030. And the aim is to have the rest come from natural gas because a lot of the electricity still here, uh, and this is for the power sector, a lot of it still comes from oil. So it's actually a double transition. So it's, I think it's a pretty bold target. And Saudi Arabia has for long been uh, emphasizing energy efficiency. And, and the reason for these two renewables and energy efficiency, as Saeed was saying, uh, they just make economic sense, both of them. They enable saving money. And so there's a case there. And, and that's the good news because money doesn't move unless there's an economic case as we've heard already today. But at the same time, there's also a realization and a recognition that the world is really moving away from oil and gas and the region has to do something about it. Either they will go with it or they will fight against it. And there's been high interest in hydrogen in the region and other parts of the world too. But this is really important for this region because hydrogen is fuel that unlocks many of the challenges for this region. It's, it's a region that does depend on oil and gas and it would like to see oil be a part of the energy mix. And so blue hydrogen, if the economics of it can be made to work, that might be one solution. But it also has a lot of sunlight. So we could have green hydrogen in the region as well. Use that domestically, decarbonize the industry. You could export it. There's so many things you can do. And another very positive development in my mind is this launching of the concept of circular carbon economy by Saudi Arabia. I won't go too deep, deep into it, but it's essentially an energy and emissions oriented concept that is based on the idea that each country has its own pathway to net zero or climate neutrality. And for this region, and also for many hard to abate sectors like heavy transport and industry, um, it, it, there might be a need for CCS and other sort of fossil fuel related solutions, at least in the transitional period. And so this has been a way for Saudi Arabia to engage in the debate. And so I, as a researcher based here, I hope that the concept will be well received because it's it's 
really something that anybody can embrace because it really embraces the, the idea is let's have all the toolkits tools in the toolbox let's kind of use all technologies and see what actually makes makes economic sense in each country's context and now also we have net zero targets in the region which which is huge i know that sunjo sound, was a bit critical about the concept but knowing the con the context of this region for a country like saudi arabia or the uae to say by mid-century they will be at net zero co2 this is a huge shift. It's really, really important. And of course, hard work remains, but that's the case for all other countries as well. And then just very briefly abroad, I think another really interesting development is that Gulf countries, although they are developing countries under the climate convention, they've actually been engaging in climate finance or the South-South cooperation quite a bit and increasingly so. So the UAE has been funding clean energy in, in small island states and other developing countries for a good decade now. Qatar about a year ago announced a total of 1 billion to the adaptation fund and the least developed countries fund, which are both climate funds. And now Saudi Arabia most recently, just before the COP, announced that it'll be setting uh, two funds, one for circular carbon economy, another one for clean cooking systems. And the idea is that the total of these funds, which would be 10 billion US dollars, the kingdom would be contributing 15%. Again, it's something that a few years ago you would not have imagined that was come, would come out of this region. So, of course, we're running out of time, but in that sense, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic at the moment. And that's what we have to be, as I said at the beginning, if we want to solve this problem. You talk about tools, uh, Marie, and I believe um, your research center based in uh, South Africa um, recently launched a tool, a tracking mechanism. Um, tell us about that and how that helps us get to I don't know, adaptation, mitigation, or net zero. Right. Uh, thanks for asking, Uli. I can do a little commercial break here about our tool. It's based on this concept of circular carbon economy, and it's called the CCE Index. And you can find it online. It's cceindex.capsarc. That's our research institute in Riyadh, capsarc.org. And the idea is to provide a tool. At the moment, we're including 30 major economies, but in the next year's edition, we'll include many more. The idea is to look at how well our country is engaging on this variety of tools in the toolbox, like energy efficiency, fuel switching, renewables, carbon sinks as well, which are a big, big uh, contributor in places like Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, how are they engaging in hydrogen in CCS? But also it has another part that looks at how well our country is positioned to progress towards circular carbon economies, which in essence is actually the same as net zero. And there, uh, one of the main findings that we see is that the very same gaps that we, we've heard about today as well, they're the very same gaps that, that need to be bridged to reach circular carbon economies. And these are policy, technology, and finance. And when we look at those 30 major economies, there's a very steep line going down. There are countries at the top that are performing very well, and then there's our they're, they're sort of steep line towards the bottom where you have countries that really are at risk of uh, getting, getting left behind in the energy transition. They need more finance, they need technology, they need better policies. And a lot of this is really enabled through, through international cooperation. And it can be South-South cooperation as well. We know there's historic responsibility, but a lot can be done by sharing lessons. And I think the key message that comes from that index is, is we it's not just about leaving people behind. That is a really, really important thing, but we can't leave countries behind in this energy transition, because if we do that, we will not reach there. So, so it is in the interest, again, of developed countries and of all countries to, to get everybody, everybody on board. Thank you, Marie. Um, Saeed, you had started telling us about how we lower the cost of the transition to, um, you know, sustainable of sustainable energies, you know, getting everyone on board, getting every, you know, whether it's, you know, the financial institutions, political institutions, you know, techno, uh, technical institutions. Um, but Marie has just been giving us examples of South-South cooperation. And um, when you look at the EU, they have a strategy for net zero. But on the African continent, we're only now, you know, getting ready um, to launch our Africa, you know, climate change um, strategy. So what does... Um, a Pan-African approach to sustainable energies look like when we have Morocco on the one hand leading, um, you know, to the extent that 
Um, it has a green policy even for its public buildings. Um, and then, you know, a policy that the continent has been working on for 10 years, you know, mm. is still not ready. Well, that's a uh, gift for our continent. And, you know, during the COP22, uh, the king organized a meeting for the head of state of Africa dedicated to all the points linked to climate change in Africa. Food security, energy, water issue, afforestation, all the impacts of climate change that we are living today in our continent. Uh, I mentioned 600 million of citizens in Africa without electricity today. Knowing the technology today, knowing when you have a good policy, not only pushing for energy transition, as I mentioned, you have to be coherent. Stop subsidizing fossil fuel. For farmers here, when we stop subsidizing diesel, the payback for solar pump, instead of 10 years, become of four years. Why? Because we stop the price of diesel increased and the price of solar panels decreased. So when you have this approach, then the economy is here. And of course, uh, uh, the cost of the transition is lower. It's for one problem, but we need, as African countries, it was discussed at Glasgow, much more support for African countries. It's nonsense today that this continent, without being the with only 4% of the energy emission, of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world, is not having this support, the financial support for adaptation and mitigation. It's not in the sense today to want to have at least what was decided in Copenhagen in the COP15 for those countries. Uh, in our continent, we can show that there is possibility. The Kingdom of Morocco mentioned, showed that when you have strong proactive policy, you can manage to reach. And another point uh, is all our countries can also benefit from the industry linked to that. You know how many jobs you can have in installing solar panels on the roofs on, on, or solar pumps. It's many jobs for the young people. In Shumunia mentioned that, uh, how young people can be involved. It's very important. Many jobs in this field as to why we have today a center in Marrakesh for capacity building uh, for solar energy in Africa. It's for that with many actors. We have uh, all the agencies in the country having links with many agencies in the continent just for to show when you have the right policy, when you have the right, the right legal framework, when you have governance, you can reach something very interesting, not only to bring electricity to people, but also at the lowest price. We reached the lowest price for renewables in Morocco because we had a governance in the field. It's very about three cents per kilowatt hour for the wind sector. It's a very low price today that we managed in some countries and also here for solar PV, it's sometimes between two and three and even sometimes less than one, than two cents per kilowatt hour. That's why we are looking for other technologies like hydro, green hydrogen for Africa also, and a lot of things can be developed. But one thing, when you have this political support, when you have dedicated agencies, it's very important also at the same time, when you have the legal framework, you have dedicated agencies and objective to reach. Uh, our objective today is 52% of the capacity of the electricity coming from renewables in 2030. Uh, it's program that we have today and dedicated agencies are working for that. And that's very important at the same time the legal forum to have these uh, dedicated agencies and to have a policy for the industry. Uh, what we managed to do in the kingdom is to have also, when you have visi you give visibility to actors, they can invest in much bigger industries. And uh, today why we have, we have a wind blade factory uh, in Morocco, we have towers. 70% of the windmills are produced here in the country. After 10 years, uh, it took many years to have the industry being implemented step by step. So when you have all those points, and I would like to finish with the, the social impact of renewables, you can develop very poor regions. 
because you have the management of your own energy in your region. When you're developing a wind park in a, in a city, you have, first of all, the electricity for the city, creating jobs in the city. So that's why uh, you need to have this approach with uh, uh, proactive policy, with a strategy, not only projects. You can have a project for, for wind park, it's one thing. But when you have a strategy for the next 10, 20 years, then you look, you can decrease the costs, you can have give visibility to everyone, and you can have more jobs creation because of that. So, and you can, of course, decrease the cost of the transition. When you have the right policy, you are coherent by decreasing the, the subsidy to fossil fuel. We are living in energy transition. It will be done step by step. Some countries in our continent, they have oil, they have gas, and of course they, uh, Mary mentioned that it's something you cannot change uh, with the rupture. You need to have to present a strategy for the next 10, 20, 30 years. That's what we did in Morocco. We are very energy dependent. That's different. We are importing all the oil, all the natural gas. So it's not like we are, we were producer. But when you look at how you can develop policy for any country, and uh, Mary mentioned how Saudi Arabia is today having a policy for renewables, strong proactive policy for renewables, is to, is to convince actors that it's the right way. It is the right way today, not only because of climate change, but also because we have the technology and we have also the economy of the project. And it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And that's why I believe that the approach is, is, is the right one. You need to have strong political support. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions have come in from the audience. And I will, uh, uh, you know, um, direct them to the people I think um, best uh, could best um, uh, answer them. And Chimonia, what distinction can we make between the green economy and sustainable development? Is this change of name intended to draw attention to environmental problems, but by ignoring the socioeconomic objectives of sustainable development? Oh, I think that is, that is quite a weighty one. I mean, I feel like when we talk about sustainable development, I keep going back to the SDGs as for me, sort of like my baseline foundation for how we think about sustainable development. And I think the SDGs in some sense gave us um, this very um, weighty and lofty set of goals where there were very many things that we needed to achieve. And so what's happened is that we've only kind of hit on some of them. And they were building from a place where we had the Millennium Development Goals where they were very short, succinct, and we could really get towards that. And so I think the transition towards green economy is trying to um, make it clearer, make that line more lean, and make, it, make the point of focus more explicit um, in terms of trying to build a more sustainable future into the world that we already have, into the economic systems that we already have that kind of references them and speaks to them clearly, but also gives us and charts a new way forward that is better for both the planet and for people. So I don't know that it's, I wouldn't say there's like necessarily like a diluting of that, but more actually just helping us to focus on what are the essentials that we need to do in order for this to practically work in our context. Right. Thank you. Um, Sanjoy, the next question builds on, on, the, on the previous one and in Timonia's response. Can there be a green economy without growth? What are the challenges and issues, social, economic, regulatory, and political, could hamper green economy, especially with the current COVID-19 situation? Uh, yeah, this is linked to uh, the previous question on sustainability. Nothing will be sustainable it is, until it is inclusive. And that's precisely the point which Saeed was trying to make. If you will not have inclusive development, if you cannot take everybody along with you, if you cannot reach energy to the poorest or the poor, you will not be sustainable. Let's forget about it. So the, whatever the SDGs are trying to do, SDGs do not work until you carry each and everybody along. Just as in COVID, you need to carry each and everybody along. You, you, you can't do it for a little isolated space. So they, see, that, that is the fundamental problem when we start talking about, yes, green is doable. And uh, Amari raised the point about you know, the, the debate between per capita and large. It, it is not about per capita. Let me tell you one thing. In India, 
in the last eight years, no, we, we, they keep, the, everyone's been saying that India got that insertion in on coal. In the last eight years, India has not put one single megawatt of coal-fired capacity. All capacity addition in India has been on renewables. And today, India's renewable capacity for every two megawatts of coal-fired capacity, we now have at least one megawatt of renewable capacity largely solar, largely wind. And when we say that we're going to do 500 megawatts by 2030, we don't need assistance for that. It will be done. But there are countries who will require that assistance. So already, I think by in the, in the next three, four years, India's renewable capacity will be far larger than its coal-fired capacity. But then that is capacity. Please remember that. That is not a generation. You are having this conversation with me. I'm talking from a place this, my voice is coming to you, the entire system, this electricity supply, which you are seeing me by, my internet is all on solar. I live in a house which is completely solar. I do not live on the grid. I live off the grid. So, in, yes, in segments, it can be done. But will this charge my electric vehicle? I don't think so. Will it manufacture the clothes I'm wearing? I don't think so. Will it run the trains in my country? I don't think so. So now when we start talking sustainability, you have to think of the larger picture. And you're, you're talking of countries which are also looking at becoming large economic powers. You think of countries who are actually thinking of becoming large military powers. Now, no one talks about it. And you're pumping in huge amounts of money into security considerations. You are expending you know, billions and billions of, if, if you start talking of energy in energy terms, it's, it's a huge expense in, the, in, that, in that manufacturing, you know, which is ridiculous manufacturing, all the bombs you're making. So let us start getting real about sustainability and transitions. Yes, this is a larger frame. Let us look at the larger frame and discuss that transition. It is doable in segments, and we do it, as I'm telling you, for two years, I have not lived on the grid. I don't live on the grid. So how green does that make me? In many things, it does make me very green. But as I said, there are certain aspects, the clothes I wear, uh, the, 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 the bottle of uh, the orange juice I drink in the morning, the milk I drink in the morning, they all have embedded carbon in them. And where is it coming from? And whose account is it going into? So there are larger questions here which need to be considered. Let us not think just in segments. Thank you, Sanjoy. Um, my next question, uh, well, it's not really my question, uh, Marie, but it's a, it's a question from the audience. And you had talked about the financing um, initiatives um, coming out of the Gulf. So the question is, how to meet the financing challenge and what are the current financing policies which act to better align financing and investments in favor of the objectives of sustainable development? Oh dear. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a tough one. It's a huge question. If I knew, I think uh, that would mean that we would have already solved the financial crisis, the, 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 the climate financing crisis, because I'm by no means an expert on financing. So um, I, I don't have the answer for, for that. I, on, on financing, um, I think we need to get the financial flows right. And colleagues have said a lot about that already. So how to get the financing to go to the things that help us and, and keep people also on board when we move toward net zero, carbon neutrality, whatever you want to call it, but a climate safe future that leaves no one behind. Um, I, I wanted to very quickly pick up on the questions on the green economy and green growth and whether growth, so obviously growth, perpetual growth on a limited planet is not possible. That is a position that many who believe in strong sustainability take. Uh, however, the paradigm in which we live at the moment is very much of, of growth. Uh, governments are based on the on the sort of understanding that if economic growth stops, then you don't create jobs and, and that's a bad thing. So our system is simply based on this idea of growth. And so that's where the idea of green growth and green economy come from. It's, it's a bit older than the previous financial crisis, but that's where the idea came from. 2009, when the big economies got together and said, how do we take opportunity of this crisis? And there the challenge was that it was about, it was about greening. It was about the economy and the environment, but the people were not included that time around. And there was a lot of criticism. Rio 2012 
was supposed to be the big moment of the green economy, and it wasn't because developing countries uh, and civil society were saying this is this is not about people. This is too much about the economy, and so lessons have been learned, and I think it's become increasingly important, uh, well recognized over recent years that. For an energy transition, climate transition, you need a just transition. And that debate is now going on in all countries, including Europe, where I'm from originally, where, where countries are realizing that if you don't bring people along, uh, you lose elections. And, and we've seen that also in other uh, northern countries. And so um, this time, the, the unfortunate thing is that although we're getting the concept right, of, of not forgetting any of those three triangles of sustainable development when we try and move towards sustainability, um, we have not collectively seized that opportunity. COVID was an opportunity and is an opportunity. And the finance, going back to finance, the flows are still not going in the right place. Countries have hit the panic button and they have subsidized and supported sectors that perpetuate the current system. And I really hope if this crisis wasn't, wasn't the chance that now that governments, many governments, not all, are on a slightly better economic footing, that they really start taking climate change seriously and thinking about where to put the money. If the time wasn't then, it really, really is now. Okay, so Marie, I'll follow up with that. Um, there was a question from the audience. Um, what are the most promising sectors um, for the future um, within the context of the green economy? Oh, there are many of them. Um, I think in terms of how do we transition the energy sector or anything that uses energy, I think, and, and again, not an expert in this, and, and this is very well known, uh, the power sector is the easy one to target in many countries. We've heard from Michimunia that in, in some countries, even the power sector is challenging. If, if there's no electricity uh, frameworks or the cost of storage is simply too high. But the power sector kind of is not quote unquote easy one. Solar power is cheap, wind power is cheap. Uh, trans, transport will be the next one. And that's where, at least the talk last year when there still was talk about sustainable recovery, uh, one of the main policy recommendations was to invest in EV infrastructure. And that's an area where you involve a lot of people, you involve a lot of labor, and that's where the energy transition, that's the next frontier. And we're already seeing a huge increase in EVs, but how to make that transition worldwide. You can invest What do you mean by EVs? Electric vehicles, I'm sorry about that. Oh, electric vehicles. Yes. And, and another sector then um, after that will be industry. That will, and heavy transport, and that will be a lot more difficult. And that's where hydrogen now is becoming a huge thing. But again, it's very costly, so not all countries will be able to afford that. A final third area that can create huge amounts of jobs and could have been a good source of recovery funding are building retrofits. Again, not the best option, obviously, in all countries, all regions, but that is an area that's labor intense and it can really uh, exploit that sort of hidden energy source that can also help reduce emissions all over, over the world. So that's kind of a retrofitting is one win-win-win. Okay, excellent. So look, um, we're coming to the end of our conversation. Um, a, a, a very thoughtful and you know challenging uh, conversation um, indeed. You know, I've had moments where I wanted to stop, let me go and process. Um, but it's been interesting having you all. And so my final question to all of you brilliant people is what one thing can your country do to strengthen international cooperation climate? Because what you pointed it, I think Sanjoy, you painted the picture um, for us by um, you know exhorting everyone to get serious and you know take geopolitics off the table. So what one thing can your country do uh, to strengthen international cooperation on climate change? And I'll start um, with Saeed and and work our way. Um, down the line? Well, of course, of course, sharing the experiences first between countries. We had, uh, during the COP22, we signed almost 20 MOUs with the different agencies from all over the continent. And uh, we mentioned that we need to share experience of each country. We need to have this capacity building because when you develop projects, you need, of course, a new legal framework. It was just discussing, but uh, uh, we discussed about that. It's uh, how sometimes when you have projects, you cannot implement them in another country because of the legal framework. So you need to look at all the points for any projects, for power, for energy transition in agriculture, for energy transition in industry, 
you need to look at all the legal framework. For example, here, we managed to have uh, uh, cement industry, steel industry, mining industry, having their own wind parks. We had to change the law for that. And we changed the law for that. And it's very important to so this cooperation to show that all the points in each country, and that's why the experiences for country who started sometimes before others to look at what are what were the, the barriers uh, and how we managed to change those to uh, to open the market for renewables it's very important that the private sector can be an actor a very important actor to implement those projects pushed by the public authorities by the government it's important because the private sector can also do the investment that's what we managed to have. All the investment came from the private sector. It's what, I'm hearing you say, what I'm hearing yeah. you say, Saeed, is that what Morocco can do to strengthen international cooperation, and not just international cooperation, it's domestic, mm -hmm. is leverage um, uh, your convening power, but also facilitating um, shared experiences. That's yeah. what I'm hearing from exactly. you. And capacity building also. And, and uh, because we have building. training centers, it's very important for young people in Africa that they know that in Africa, we have African solutions today, and we have also uh, capacity building in Africa for that. Okay, so let's go to a beneficiary of your capacity building in Chimunya, um, your um, an, em uh, an emerging leader uh, for the policy uh, the policy center, which is uh, based in Morocco. What one thing can your country, South Africa, do to strengthen international cooperation on climate change? I mean. I think one of the things that we can do is just like get it right. So we started a really exciting and dynamic renewable energy investment program in the early 2010s, about 2012, 2014. We've still up until recently really been struggling to get um, those projects onto the grid and successfully integrated into our current system. And so I think that if we really spend this time to focus on showing models of both private participation and government cooperation in building renewable energy onto the grid, I think that creates a really great example for the rest of the region and something that we can learn from. So I think we should just like get on with it, get it right and get that renewable on the grid. Great, thank you. Uh, Sanjoy, what one thing can your country, India, do to strengthen international cooperation on climate change? Uh, the first thing, I uh, not just India, which uh, most of us can do and should do is to set an example. Not, not wait for others to take the lead into what can be done to uh, fight climate change. Set an example, uh, do whatever energy you are now going to be producing, please focus more and more on renewable sources. But as I said, you need to be inclusive all the time, take on everybody along. And in that inclusive debate, become a voice for other countries who are marginalized. And that is something which India can do very, very well. India has a weight, India has a clout. It can become the voice, it should become the voice for many others who've been marginalized in this entire climate debate. I think that is what India should do. Okay, so from you, I've heard, get serious, get real, set an example, be inclusive and speak up. That's what yes. I'm hearing. Right. Yes. And, okay. And Marie, you have the final word and you, you represent um, several countries, but I'll speak to, I, I believe you're Finnish originally. Um, what one thing can Finland do to strengthen international cooperation on climate change? I have left Finland over a decade ago. I think there's a lot that Finland can do uh, to support developing countries, but also work on its own emissions. But what I really would like to focus on is, is the region where I've been for the past decade. So Middle East and, okay. and the Arab world. And so the, the thought that I have here is that I think the next COP, because we we kind of- Next COP is in Egypt. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, sorry? The next COP is in Egypt. Exactly. So so the, the COP now in Glasgow kept the flame of 1.5 alive, but it's a very weak flame. So of course, so much more is needed. And everybody is already now, everybody who came out of Glasgow is already focused on COP27. And that's going to be in Egypt. COP28 will be in the UAE. So it's going to be in the Arab world. And of course, the next COP will be a COP for Africa. However, I think these two COPs have a lot of opportunities uh, for co collaboration on issues and showcasing issues that Africa and Middle East find important. And these include adaptation, finance, but also loss and damage, which is that these, these impacts of climate change that can not lo no longer be adapted to. So things like storms where, where 
if the infrastructure gets damaged and so forth and sea level rise. But also things like arid regions, agriculture, there's a lot of areas there. And also to the point that Sanjay was saying, I think it'll be a great opportunity to showcase the amazing action on emissions that is already taking place in these two regions. So I would say everybody, including us researchers, but also business leaders and other governments, let's support the next two COPs and help them make a success or make help make them a success. Okay, thank you. Plenty of food for thought you've left us um, all with. Um, and I hope the audience agrees with me that um, when I said that we had an extraordinary lineup of uh, speakers, um, that they actually did deliver um, extraordinary insights, which hopefully have gotten us all thinking about what we can do individually and collectively um, to ensure that um, we don't become extinct as a race. Um, uh, well, the human race, I mean, you know, in terms of humanity. And so I'd like to thank you all, Njimunya Hamukoma, Sanjoy Joshi, Marie Luomi, and Said Mulin. Thank you for your time and your generosity and your brilliance. You were an awesome panel to moderate. And I thank you um, for the privilege of moderating you. I'd also like to thank the team at uh, Atlantic Dialogues for putting together this panel and for having me on board. Thank you.